never met anyone as a lawyer or a judge that knows as much about the law and has it readily available uh, at the his fingertips in his memory bank as Judge Miller. Uh, he's a phenomenal scholar of the law. He's been uh, president of the Iowa Judges Association. He's been chief judge of our judicial district. He recently received the award of merit from the Iowa Judges Association for his valuable contributions uh, to the judges and to the state of Iowa and the citizens of Judge Miller. a lot of familiar faces and some not so familiar. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, the topic is uh, separation of powers and role of the courts. Um, two somewhat interrelated concepts. First a couple or three foundational things uh, that I might suggest. You'll hear the term common law a time or two. I think maybe we heard it already once this evening. Common law is a body of legal principles and concepts that evolved over time, uh, over centuries, by judges in English courts of law. It was adopted by the states of our country as the initial rules of law. Um, secondly, both the United States and individual states have adopted constitutions uh, which by either express provisions in the constitutions or general agreement and practice are the supreme law within their respective jurisdictions. Uh, that's to me a very important point. The constitution is the principle and, and controlling the supreme law in the United States. The Iowa constitution is the supreme law, if you will, in the state of Iowa. As far as the U.S. Constitution is concerned, Article 6, Paragraph 2 says, and I quote it in part, in part that's relevant to our discussion this evening, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution and laws of any state, to the contrary notwithstanding. Let's turn to the separation of powers for a moment. Historical background, colonial governors uh, during our country's pre-revolutionary colonial period, uh, colonial governors were appointed by the English monarchs. The colonial governors performed not only legislative, but also executive and judicial functions. After the revolution and the adoption of the United States and state constitutions, these three functions were divided and distributed to different branches of various governments. Where did this concept of separation of powers come from? Uh, why, why do we have it? Uh, back in the pre-revolutionary days, a lot of political philosophers and legal thinkers talked about separation of powers. They talked about it as a way to avoid concentration of power in one or more individuals or branches of government that might abuse the other branches or abuse the people. A Frenchman, Montesquieu, was one of the leading uh, authors, theorists in this area. He lived from 1689 to 1755, well before our Declaration of Independence and uh, the Constitution. He received a law degree at age 19, continued his legal studies, for years later was uh, held in a judicial and administrative position in France where he heard legal cases, supervised the prisons, and uh, performed a lot of related duties, uh, duties related to the administration of justice. In, 18, in, I'm sorry, in 1731, at age 42, he began writing uh, a massive work on the law called The Spirit of Laws. It was eventually published in 1748. A lot of our ideas that the founding fathers of this country had about separation of powers come from modesty. He suggested there were three basic forms of government, the Republican form of government, which can be either democratic or aristocratic in subform, if you will, monarchies, and despotisms. 
in his view, in a democracy, and I think it's a view we would share, the people are sovereign. The people decide what the laws are, whether it's directly or indirectly. Uh, Montesquieu viewed uh, or opined that uh, in uh, democracies, the people may govern through others, but those others must be chosen by the people. They must be people selected uh, by the populace in order to make their laws and, and in effect control their lives. What was Montesquieu's guiding principle? Liberty. Living under laws that protect us from harm but leave us as free as possible while protecting us from harm. Uh, it was his view that if government is to provide citizens the greatest possible liberty, because human fallibility leads men to abuse power, power must be checked, restrained by other power. How is that to be done? Separation of the legislative, executive, and judicial powers of government so that different bodies exercise these powers, and each can check the others if the others attempt to go beyond their proper roles or otherwise abuse their powers. Uh, Montesquieu suggested certain principles or arrangements that would lead to or assist in this division of power. First, the legislature alone should have the power to tax so that it could deprive the executive of funding if the executive attempted to go beyond its appropriate role. Second, the executive should have the power to veto legislation so that it can stop legislation that infringes on the role of other branches or otherwise exceeds its own power. Uh, somewhat similarly, the legislature, as the most powerful body, at least in theory, should include two bodies, each of which can prevent inappropriate acts of the other from becoming law. Does that sound kind of familiar with what we, uh, what we have today? And this was theory back in the uh, early and mid-1700s. Uh, what, what next do we have about separation of powers? In the period of 1787 and 1788, during the Constitutional Convention and the ratification process, there were 85 essays written that later came to be known as the Federalist Papers. These were written primarily by three author, authors, and they were all legal philosophers and, and uh, students of the law, legal theorists in their own right. Alexander Hamilton was a close associate of George Washington in the Continental Army. Army. He was New York's representative to the An Annapolis Convention of 1786, which was called originally with the thought of revising the Articles of Confederation, which people felt uh, were too weak to uh, uh, serve as the new government of this country. Hamilton, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Hamilton later served as Secretary of Treasury in, the, uh, in George Washington's administration. A second primary author was John Jay. And I mention these people just because they're the primary authors of the Federalist Papers from which you get a lot of the theory for the U.S. Constitution and our form of government. Jay was a delegate to the First Continental Congress. He drafted the New York Constitution. He was Chief Justice of the New York Supreme Court. He was a delegate to and president of the Second Continental Congress. He was Secretary of Foreign Affairs under the Articles of Confederation, that is the position that uh, under our Constitution became what's presently the Secretary of State, and Jay as well was the first Chief Justice of the United States from 1789 to 95. Third leading author was James Madison. He was a delegate also to the Annapolis Convention of 1786. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, many referred to him as the father of the Constitution because he was one of its principal drafters and he also kept detailed notes about the proceedings of the uh, convention. And as most of you know, uh, Madison served as the uh, fourth president of the United States. So you can see these authors of the Federalist Papers brought uh, powerful of backgrounds in legal philosophy and political theory to their jobs in drafting the Constitution. Federalist paper number 70, I'm sorry, number 48, written by Madison. He says that having shown 
and what he says having shown, he's referring back to Federalist Paper Number 47. He says, having shown that separation of powers does not require that the three branches be fully separate, uh, unless they are so connected and blended as to give each a constitutional control over the others, the degree of separation essential to a free government cannot be maintained. He goes on, the great problem is what practical security ought to be provided to each branch to prevent the others from passing the limits assigned to those branches and invading the powers of the others. Madison then identifies legislative encroachment on the other branches as the principal danger in a representative republic. And in doing that, in uh, Federalist Paper Number 48, he cites Virginia as an example of such a danger, quoting Jefferson, uh, who, uh, during his term as governor of, of Virginia in uh, 1779, uh, felt very strongly that the legislature had infringed upon executive and perhaps judicial powers. Madison also cited uh, the experience of Pennsylvania in the period of 1783 and 1784 uh, as a situation in which the legislature had clearly encroached on the rights and the powers of the executive and judicial branches. So what conclusion is reached in uh, Federalist Paper 48, uh, and I partly quote, partly paraphrase, the, dear, the mere demarcation on paper of constitutional limits of the branches is not a sufficient guard against those encroachments which lead to a tyrannical con con concentration of all the powers of government in the same hands. Let's turn to Federalist Paper 51, again written by Madison. He says, what then shall we do to maintain in practice the necessary partition of power among the branches as set out in the Constitution. His answer, the government must be structured so that its parts may, by their mutual relations, be the means of keeping each other in their proper places. First, the members of each branch should have as little involvement as possible in the appointment of members of the others. Second, the members of each branch should be as little dependent as possible on the members of the others. He goes on to state for his view that the great difficulty lies in first enabling the government to control the government, while second obliging the government to control itself. What's the solution in Madison's view and the view of, uh, of the other uh, leading authorities, if you will, of the era, era? Divide and arrange governmental power in such a manner as that each branch may be a check on the other. There still remains a concern. It's impossible to give each branch an equal power of self-defense because in the Republican form of government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. What's the remedy for uh, a powerful legislature? Divide the legislature into two different branches and render them as little connected with each other as possible by providing first, different modes of election, second, different principles of action. And you'll recall that uh, early on, although now we have direct election of our U.S. Senators, originally, under the original U.S. Constitution, the four amendments, U.S. Senators were selected differently than U.S. Representatives. The Senators were selected by state legislators. And that's uh, consistent with this view that there be different votes of election in different uh, houses of Congress. Madison said, what other, what other safeguards do we have or can we enforce? First, the federal system, where power surrendered by the people the government is divided between two governments, federal and state, and each in turn is divided into branches, thus exerting checks and control on each other. And secondly, and this doesn't seem to get much recognition, but he says, a fear by the stronger elements of society that if through government the weaker may be oppressed, the stronger are themselves susceptible to oppression, leading the stronger to submit to a government which may protect the weak as well as themselves. The very concept of government and constitutional protections really being there for the protection 
process and also is protecting the strong. Uh, how, does, how, is the, how are some of these theories reflected in the federal constitution? Well, Article 1, Section 1, all legislative powers to Congress. And Article 2, Section 1, executive power vested, vested in the President. Article 3, Section 1, the judicial power is vested in one Supreme Court and such other inferior courts as Congress may from time to time provide for. Well, if we have separation of powers, how much separation? Is it to be total separation? Well, let's look at Federalist Paper number 47, again, with Madison as the principal author. And when I identify Madison, you must realize that in many of these, John Jay was also a co-author, but uh, ultimately Madison is given most of the credit. <coughs> Madison and the authors say the accumulation of all powers, executive and judicial, executive, legislative, executive, and judicial in the same hands may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Madison then again turns to modesty and points out that modesty, although the primary theorist of separation of powers, was a great fan of the British Constitution, and the British Constitution itself did not involve total separation. Uh, Madison also looked at the state constitutions and pointed out that other than the constitutions of Rhode Island and Connecticut, which were enacted prior to uh, the revolutionary period, all of the 11 remaining state constitutions involved some interaction and some interplay uh, between the branches. Again, how, how is this separation, but not complete separation, reflected in the United States Constitution? We've mentioned the three articles that set out the separate branches, but what are the interactions? First, the president, part of the executive, appoints the federal judiciary and other, and other officers, but subject to Senate approval. Second, the president makes treaties, but subject to approval by two-thirds of the senators. Third, the president may veto legislation passed by Congress, subject, however, to override by two-thirds of each house. Uh, next, the vice president, a member of the executive, uh, is the president of the Senate, but and may vote in cases of a tie. Uh, one other that occurs to me is the House may impeach federal officers, both of the ju judicial branch and the uh, executive branch, and the Senate then has the sole power to try impeachments. Uh, how is some of this uh, separation of powers reflected in the Iowa Constitution? Article 3, Section 1. Again, partly a paraphrase, partly a quote. Powers of government are divided into the legislative, executive, and judicial. No person charged with exercising powers under one branch shall exercise any function of another, except in cases expressly directed or permitted hereafter. And by the hereafter, I take that to mean in the Iowa Constitution itself. Um, we've talked about separation of powers. Uh, how, what, what is the role of courts within that separation of powers? Uh, at English common law, the colonial courts were part of the British judicial system. Um, Upon independence, the federal and state courts adopted the English model, including substantive laws and procedural rules. At English common law, courts settled disputes between individuals. And we'll see a little bit of development where courts, initially with the role of settling disputes between individuals, then change over time. What does the federal constitution provide? And again, in relevant part, Article 3, Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution or the laws of the United States. Also, it extends to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, not an individual, the United States itself, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, and between the state or the citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens or subjects. So we're now in a constitutional way from the English tradition.
recognition of courts settling disputes only among individuals. The Constitution provides for settling disputes between citizens and government and between different uh, branches or agencies of government. Um, an early case, Marbury versus Madison, and a second case, Martin versus Hunter's lessee. Um, first, Marbury. In March 18, right at the end of President John Adams' of term of office, Marbury was nominated to be a Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia, and everything necessary to complete that appointment uh, occurred except that his commission was not delivered to him before Adams left office. Uh, Marbury uh, brought a lawsuit in the United States Supreme Court, an action in mandamus, an action to compel uh, an order that James Madison, one of our authors of the Federalist Papers, and now new President Jefferson, Secretary of State, deliver the commission to him. The Supreme Court considered the case, but ultimately dismissed it, holding that it was without original jurisdiction to entertain it. This marked an early case in our country's history in which the Supreme Court considered a case other than one between two private individuals. Um, a, a matter that I think many of us thought was uh, settled as long as 200 years ago or more uh, from time to time rears its head again, and that is the question of the role of courts in determining the constitutionality of legislation. Um, the federal constitution has equal protection clauses, due process clauses, and entire bill of rights. The Iowa constitution, as Justice Waterman said, has many similar provisions, some of, them, some of them identical, some of them worded uh, somewhat differently. The Iowa Constitution provides in part, Article 1, Section 6, all laws of a general nature shall have a uniform application. The General Assembly shall not grant to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which, upon the same terms, shall not equally belong to all citizens. Uh, when this question arises of whether or not courts have the authority or the jurisdiction to determine the constitutionality of statutes, sometimes we hear phrases like, when a court does so, it's legislating from the bench, it exceeds its jurisdiction, its action is uh, unprecedented, and so on. And I'd like to take that on uh, head on for a moment. Talk about some uh, early legal theorists. Uh, Lord Edward Coke was the Chief Justice of the English Court of Common Pleas in a case in 1610, over 400 years ago, made this statement, and again it's pretty much a quote. The common law will control acts of parliament and adjudge them to be utterly void when those acts are against common right and reason. Now, I haven't been able to look up and find uh, Dr. Bonham's case. I suppose if I went up to the uh, law library in Iowa City, I could find it probably at the university. But if you substitute the word constitution for common right, it would read the common law will control acts of parliament and adjudge them to be utterly void when those acts are against the constitution. What was the practice in state courts even before the adoption of the Constitution? Uh, immediately following uh, independence, several cases exist in which state courts held acts of the legislature's void as violating provisions of their state constitutions, that is, their supreme law as set forth in the constitutions. One of the most frequently mentioned is Holmes versus Walton, the New Jersey case of 1780, occurring some eight or nine years before the adoption of the United States Constitution. What did the founders of this country, those that participated in constitutional conventions and wrote the Federalist Papers, think about the courts uh, passing muster, if you will, on acts of the legislature and whether or not those acts of the legislature 
conformed to constitutional requirements. Let's look for a moment at one more of the Federalist Papers, number 78, written by Hamilton. Hamilton states, the complete independence of courts from the other two branches is peculiarly essential in cases of a limited constitution. What he meant by limited constitution one is one that places limits on what government and its branches can do. He says limitations of this kind, that is those set forth in constitutions, can be preserved in practice no other way than through the courts whose duty it must be to declare any act that violates the Constitution void. Without this, all of the reservations of particular rights or privileges to the people in the Constitution would amount to nothing. The uh, Federalist Papers, again, Madison, I'm sorry, Hamilton, the principal author, but others participating went on to say, the Constitution is the fundamental law expressing the will of the people. The interpretation of the law is the proper role of courts and is solely the role of courts. It therefore must belong to the courts to determine the meaning of constitutional provisions as well as the meaning of legislative acts. Whether there is a conflict between a legislative act and a constitutional provision, and if there is a conflict, to declare the legislative act void because of the conflict. This does not mean that judicial power is superior to legislative power. It simply means that the power of the people, as expressed in their constitution, the supreme law, is superior to both the legislature and the judiciary. Uh, getting back for a moment to Marbury versus Madison, uh, Article 3, Section 2 of the United States Constitution provides that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in limited specified cases and that in all other cases it has appellate jurisdiction, that is, it can only entertain appeals from other courts. <coughs> The uh, Judiciary Act of 1789 purported to give the Supreme Court original jurisdiction in cases of mandamus, the type of action that Mar Marbury brought, which was not one of the types of cases in which the Constitution provides that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction. The Supreme Court held that that part of the Judiciary Act violated the Constitution and was thus void. It dismissed Marbury's suit. Martin versus Hunter's Lessee, 1816, the first case in which the United States Supreme Court addressed the constitutionality of uh, an act of uh, the state court. Uh, the, the Supreme Court in, in that case pronounced unconstitutional the decision of Virginia's highest court. The fight in that case was really about whether the U.S. Supreme Court had appellate jurisdiction or the U.S. State Court's decision that was based on federal law, and uh, ever since there has been. What about Iowa? We'll conclude with Iowa for just a moment. Um, case in 2004, Racing Association of Central Iowa versus Fitzgerald. Uh, Riverboat casinos and land-based casinos were taxed substantially differently. I think the land-based ones were taxed almost twice as much as river-based casinos. The uh, question was whether or not that law violated the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Iowa Constitution. The Iowa Supreme Court held that it did four years ago, five years ago, well, seven years ago now, nobody raised any claim that the court was uh, acting beyond its jurisdiction, exceeded its authority, or was legislating from the bench. I thought I would take a quick look and see how long the uh, history of, uh, of courts in Iowa reviewing acts of the legislature has existed. I took a quick look. I find a case that I find, I hope you'll find a little bit interesting, Reed versus Wright, May of 1849. <coughs> That's 160 some years ago. A case occurred by the Iowa Supreme Court right here in Burlington. It involved matters in Lee County. Uh, at the time, Iowa and Wisconsin were territories. The United States Constitution passed the Northwest Ordinance, 
of more profit than the ordinance of 1787. It provided how uh, territories would gain non-voting representatives in the House of Representatives, how territories would become states. It also provided certain basic fundamental rights to all of the people living in the territories, including the right to jury trial. What happened after that was the Wisconsin Territorial Legislature and the Iowa Territorial Legislature passed laws that said that since there were disputes about land ownership in what was then called, I guess still is called, the Half-Breed Tract, essentially the southern half of Lee County, three commissioners would be appointed. They would take evidence, decide who owned that land and make their decisions, submit them to a judge in Lee County. That judge was obligated to enter a judgment and enforce the decision of the commissioners, and that occurred. That was taken up on appeal. The Iowa Supreme Court said no. That those those uh, acts passed by the Wisconsin Legislature, the Territorial Legislature, and the Iowa Territorial Legislature are unconstitutional. They violate the federal law, the Ordinance of 1787, by depriving people of their right to jury trial. So I guess, uh, in conclusion, I would like to suggest that uh, when the question arises about whether courts can or should determine the constitutionality of acts of Congress or of the legislature in the case of states, we have precedent that goes back to 1610 in English common law. Early states, before the <coughs> constitutions were adopted, had that practice. The founding fathers, clearly provided for it, argued for it, held it as basic in the Federalist Papers. The United States Supreme Court early cases uh, uh, did the same, and Iowa has a history of 160 years during which the court has properly reviewed acts of the legislature to see whether or not they are consistent with the rights of people as set forth in the Constitution. Uh, probably taken substantially more than my allotted time. I'd entertain any uh, quick questions, but don't want to cut into other people's time, sir. So, if Congress has the right to declare war, uh, does the executive branch actually have <coughs> control over the military during time of war, and are there any checks on that power? I think you're asking a question that's uh, far behind, far beyond my knowledge. You know, there's always been that fight uh, between executive and legislative power with respect to foreign relations and war. Uh, it's not an area that I know it's not an area I deal with. I know that, uh, what, some 20, 30 years ago or more, there was a War Powers Act that passed by Congress. I think it's called the War Powers Act that tried to resolve some of these conflicts and delineate what in Congress's view the rights of the executive were and what the rights of Congress were. But uh, you're really asking something that I have very little, have no expertise and very little knowledge. If uh, we want equal enforcement, how do you justify as court system the idea that local bars can't allow patrons to smoke, but the casinos can? I've never been able to meld that in my brain. Uh, I'm, we, we have an expert on that in the audience. It's one of our speakers tonight. <laughs> I don't want to point any fingers. But, uh, the judge that had to address that very issue. Uh, I think a lot of us have a problem with that. And it has to do with the equal rights provisions of the Constitution. And, and you know, what, what does it mean when it said, when they say equal rights, people have equal rights? What are the limits? What are the things? Well, you know, I can give you a basic principle or two. Uh, people can be treated differently if their situations are different but people that are similarly situated with respect to the legislation in question have to be treated similarly. Um, 
I think there's quite a bit of authority. Well, I, I see not. I see more than one expert uh, <laughs> in the courtroom that would be better that have actually dealt with that issue and uh, maybe maybe uh, we discuss it uh, rather than from the podium. Maybe uh, at some time during the break or after our session. But some of us have trouble with that. Uh, legislature has a lot of authority when it, when it relates to taxation, when it relates to public health and matters of that sort. And beyond that, I, I can't really uh, justify that decision. It, but by the way, in terms of the smoking laws, people are pretty well aware that the legislature exempted casinos, but what is often ignored is there are five, six, seven, maybe other exemptions in that same law. I, I wouldn't purport to know them. I want to say the soldiers and sailors home or whatever it is uh, in Marshalltown, maybe it was exempted. There are a whole variety of exemptions there. The casinos aren't known. Mr. Hubble. Judge, um, can you simply reflect on how our particular selection of judges in Iowa might relate to this whole separation of power concept? If it does, if you think it does, or, or if you think it doesn't. Yeah. That, that was my first reaction, Roger. I, I'm not sure that it, uh, that it does. Uh, some of the founding fathers in the Federalist Papers said that in order to have an independent judiciary uh, that can remain fair and impartial, lifetime tenure is absolutely necessary. And that's the federal model. Uh, some states have adopted that model. I was not one of them. You know, judges are selected for a term and then stand for retention in office. Uh, I, beyond that, I, I don't know that it relates much to separation of powers. Uh, you know, judges are members of the judiciary. We have the executive, which is the governor and the executive departments. But there is that overlap that we talked about, not complete separation. When people are nominated for the judgeship, they go before the governor who selects uh, one of the applicants, one of the nominees. So, so there's some relationship there. And uh, it would violate a principle of total separation. But again, I think we see that the theorists say that total separation is needed and maybe some cross action, if you will, is necessary to uh, for the concept of separation of powers to hold various branches within the proper and appropriate grounds. Maybe there will be time for more questions later. I hope Mr. Keith. Oh. My turn. Yes. What, uh, in your experience, uh, what uh, on appeal do you have, uh, is there any uh, instance where a friend of the court has, has some bearing on your ultimate decision? I'm thinking particularly of a case in Newton uh, where the Americans United for Separation of Church and State entered the, the contest as a friend of the court. Uh, regarding the uh, favoring prisoners who were who would take part in the religious activity, um, I've served almost most of ten years in the court of appeals, and then three years part time as a senior judge. Now, I can't speak very well for that because the court of appeals doesn't get very many cases where there's a friend of the court in the brief. If the cases are significant enough that uh, people other than the parties to the lawsuit are to be involved in appeal, they're usually kept by the Iowa Supreme Court, and, and it makes decisions, I think, as to whether or not to entertain friend of the court briefs. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a case 